as you said, I'm Dr. Russell Warren. I got my PhD uh, in education psychology with the emphasis in research, measurement, and statistics from Texas A&M as in 2011. I got my bachelor's degree right here at BYU in psychology, and um, I was actually introduced to this department way back then because I was the Anchor's research assistant when I was an undergraduate. And so now I feel like everything's coming full circle. Here I am again, the IPT department, talking about research again. The more things stay the same, like some more things change, the more they stay the same, apparently. Um, I consider myself a quantitative psychologist, but when I do that applied research, I love to do it most in educational psychology and in applied education. And so I hope in this presentation to show you a little bit of a blend of advanced methods plus some of my applied research. I use my applied research as the data example here. Um, I love being able to collect and analyze data about people, and I think the great thing about um, quantitative psychology is it gives you a lot of versatility. I've published in medical education, I've published in K-12 education, um, I've published in nutrition journals, um, I have a sociology article coming out this week, and so it's great because you learn how to gather data that can be applied in a wide variety of situations. And Plus for someone with a short attention span like me, it's really fun to figure out new areas where you can apply methodology. So the methodology I want to talk about today is propensity score analysis and marginal mean weighting through stratification. And the applied example I'm going to show you, the real data I've been working on and that I've submitted to a journal, is about the advanced placement, or the AP program. Um, so uh, I do want to take questions as you go along, because the absolute worst thing you can do in teaching stats is to just forge ahead and take questions at the end. So, if you need anything clarified, or you don't understand what I'm saying, stop me right away, raise your hand, and I will make sure that we're all on the same page. Otherwise, in an hour, we're going to be lost. I'm already lost. <laughs> I promise I will, apply, I will defy all of these words. I guarantee you. So there's three parts to this presentation, this workshop. Um, the number one part is just to talk about the theory of propensity score matching. Just talk about the theoretical background before there's any sort of numbers or equations put on it. Let's just talk about why people use these methods and the obstacles that, that we can overcome, the real world research obstacles we can overcome if we use them. And then I'll actually show you a propensity score matching study with two groups. And then after that, the last section is the three group extension. So we're going to start with theory, then we start with the relatively simpler method and then the complex one. It'll, each section builds on previous ones. They have four learning outcomes you can see there. The first one should be the easiest. It's just the logic of inferring cause and effect in traditional true experiments. And anyone here who's had at least one semester of research methods should be able to, to follow that without too much trouble. But then we're going to move on to the differences between how propensity score methods and traditional methods for controlling for covariates, how, the, how these two methods vary. And then I want everyone to understand how you can calculate propensity scores and use them to control for the influence of covariates, and then to recognize the additional complexity of ex extending this to three or more groups. So that's the, that's the game plan for the presentation. Right. So for the first part, theory of propensity score matching, the best way to start this off is to talk about one of the simplest possible designs and actually one of the worst possible designs, the one-shot case study. Um, and I'd like to start off with this because it is the simplest possible and it's actually how most people conceive of, of the effectiveness of educational research. And in this, all you do is you draw a sample member from the population and then that person gets the treatment and you examine their dependent variable. And you do the same thing for everybody. And everyone flows through the study the same way. Uh, this is the worst possible type of design if you want to learn about cause, because at the end when we examine dependent variable scores, we don't know whether the outcomes are because of the treatment, whether it's because of, of other variables that might be influencing people's outcomes. Um, there's not a lot we can say about cause here. So, it's the worst possible design. 
and mostly because we don't have any sort of control group. We don't know what would have happened to these people in the study if they hadn't received the treatment. We don't know whether the treatment helped them a lot, whether it helped them a little bit. We don't even know if the treatment even harmed them, which sometimes occasionally happens in social science research. So we don't know anything about cause because we don't have any sort of outcomes to compare subjects with. The only way that we can find out what would have happened to this person is if we could simultaneously observe what would happen to them without the treatment and with them. So the way I like to think of this is like a science fiction story. I'm a little bit of a fan of sci-fi. We observe what happens in the real world. And we can observe what happens to these people after they experience the treatment. But we can't enter some sort of parallel universe or alternate timeline where we can observe the same people without the treatment. We either give them the treatment or we don't. And right now we can only observe what happens. Without traveling to some sort of parallel universe, we can't observe what doesn't happen. And so because of that, we don't know how the treatment impacts each person. Because with the one-shot case study, this is all the information we get. So if we want to estimate, oh, excuse me, one thing, glad I put it on here. We call these the observed outcomes. What doesn't happen is called the counterfactual, or the counterfactual outcomes. So we only observe observed outcomes, not counterfactuals. And we can't observe treatment effects without having some way of estimating counterfactuals. We don't know how effective the treatment is for people who get it unless we have some sort of idea of what would have happened to them if they hadn't had the treatment. I hope I don't sound like I'm repeating myself. There's two methods to estimate counterfactuals. One is the classical or the true experiments. Um, in medicine, you often um, have, you see them called um, CRTs, controlled randomized trials. And then we have propensity score analysis. Everyone here should be familiar with the classical experiment design. This is simplified. Um, some people like to have pre-tests in here and post-tests, et cetera. But instead of that, path, that one pathway that everybody in the study follows, like in the one-shot case study, once you draw sample members from the population, they get randomly assigned to either an experimental or a control group. And then afterwards, we compare the experimental group scores with the control group scores. All right, this, this should be basic research methods for everyone here. And that's, that's the classical experiment. And the reason that works is not because it tells us counterfactual information for individuals. This equation says delta, or the difference between one person receiving the treatment and that same person not receiving the treatment, that's the treatment effect for that person. We still can't estimate this. We still can't estimate the, the counterfactual for a person at the individual level, because they either get the experimental treatment or the control treatment. But we can average everyone's scores and then find the sample level treatment effect. And this is because each group, if we use random assignment, serves as a counterfactual for the other group, random assignment. And so we can find at the sample level the expected value that, that people will have on average if they receive the treatment and the expected value that they'll have, the score on average they'll have after the control group um, treatment. And that difference between the two is the average impact of the treatment. So the classical true experiment still doesn't tell us individual counterfactual information, but it does at the group level. And usually that's what we're most interested in. And it's a very elegant solution to this, to the problem, the fact that we can't observe counterfactuals directly. This was Fisher's idea of how to investigate counterfactuals. Um, so Ronald Fisher theorized that if assignment is random, then each group on average balances out the other group. 
that the unique characteristics that people have in the two groups get balanced out if you have a large enough sample. And so with random assignment, we should have, on average, the same number of males in both the experimental and the control group. And females, the same number of females in both groups. And that gender is balanced out across the two groups. Um, other things that, that we believe often are covariates or often interfere with our treatment estimates in education. SES groups will be balanced out across groups if you have random assignments. Um, so will different levels of motivation be balanced out. And then the beauty of random assignment is that it even balances out variables that we don't care about. Because it balances out everything, at least in theory. So it'll also balance out your groups on tap dancing ability. It'll balance out your groups and how well they can juggle. Even if you don't think that's related to your outcome, random assignment will balance out. You'll have the same number of jugglers and non-jugglers in each group. It, it, it's amazing. And so, because all those unique characteristics balance out, we get counterfactual information at the group level with random assignment. Any questions to this point? Most of it should be review, am I, am I right? Okay. The problem with true experiments or classical experiments is that Often they're not possible in educational research. In fact, I've, I browsed my article archive and I found, for example, in this huge meta-analysis of studies of grade retention, there was not a single classical experiment. Out of, out of hundreds of articles published in gifted education journals, just barely over 2% of them were true experiments with random assignment and everything. Almost the exact same percentage in the Journal of Learning Disabilities, which I thought was interesting, too extremes and two ends of the, the two tails of the curve have about the same percentage of, of true experiments. Slightly higher in the Journal of Counseling Development. In fact, actually it's over double, but still, true experiments are a very small minority of studies because often they're not possible. When I teach this to my undergrads across town at UVU, um, I ask them to imagine what would happen if Alpine School District randomly assigned children to teachers and schools. And it doesn't take very long before hands start coming up. They say things like, it'll ruin carpools, and other people raise their hands and say, families would be angry if three different kids attend three different elementary schools. And often the real world in interferes with our ability to do true experiments. So propensity score, match, uh, propensity score methods were developed to simulate true experiments when they aren't possible, which is very frequent in our field. So. Often we're doing these quasi-experiments, which look similar to the true experiment, but instead of this really powerful random assignment, we have this nebulous, cloudy, non-random assignment. And when it's all done, we find that our groups aren't balanced when we have non-random assignment very frequently. Over here in the control group, I seem to have subjects who are cyan. Um, they seem to be more likely to be in the control group in the experiments, but they seem to be yellow. And if I try to compare their scores in a quasi-experiment design, then I'm going to have pre-existing group differences interfering with that. And that's going to either cause me to over or underestimate the impact of my treatment because of these, these groups not being <coughs> equivalent. Whenever you have non-random assignments, some form of selection bias. I refer to selection bias in the sense of selecting people for groups. Um, I have a couple different examples here. A really common one is self-selection. If we allow people to, to choose what groups they get into, then we rarely have equivalent groups. It basically doesn't happen. You get health nuts being in the gym membership group that gets free gym memberships to see how that does their health. You get couch potatoes wanting to be in the control group because they don't want to get off the couch in a health adventure, for example. You often get bureaucratic selection with means <laughs> tested government programs. The lower your income is, the more likely you are to get the benefit. And so if we compare um, subjects who got, who received the government benefit with those who didn't, we have groups that are not equivalent here. Geography, some interventions aren't available in some areas. And where a person lives or how far they're willing to travel may determine what group they end up with. 
Another serious one is differential attrition. Even if you do randomly assign people to groups, if they drop out of the study at different rates, it may cause your groups at the end to not be equivalent anymore. It doesn't matter. And there's other ways that selection bias can happen. Regardless of how or why it happens, whenever you have selection bias, anything besides ran random assignment, you are missing counterfactual information that can help you get an unbiased, accurate estimate of the treatment's effectiveness. And sometimes that may cause the treatment's effectiveness to be overestimated, sometimes it may cause it to be underestimated, depending on how assignment occurred. So there's three traditional ways to control for selection bias. One of the most common is multiple regression where you just measure your covariates that you think are important that your groups might vary on, and then you include them as covariates in your multiple regression equation. And at the end, you have a beta value for your treatment variable, and that is your estimate for the impact of the treatment while holding all the other variables constant. It's, it works very well and if, you, if you have the proper covariates. Another way of dealing with this is through matching where you pick a number of covariates and you measure them for your subjects. And so for example, if I choose ethnicity and gender, if I have a Hispanic female in my control group, I make sure I have a Hispanic female in my experimental group. And if one drops out of the study, I drop the other. This is a very old way of matching uh, and balancing my groups on the covariates. Um, you can add as many covariates as you want, but obviously it gets more complex the more covariates you have. Usually that matching ratio is one to one. You make sure you have each person matched with a single person in, other group, in the other group, but there's no reason why it can't be higher. But usually it's easiest to match one to one. And that will balance on those covariates you match on. Another method is stratification. You see this a lot in research on human intelligence. With stratification, you divide up your sample into strata based on their scores on one or more covariates, and you analyze <coughs> the data, you run your statistical analyses only for members in each stratum independently. So for example, in human intelligence, because of cultural and economic differences, often you'll have this big, large sample of people, but researchers will analyze data from their white subjects separately from their black subjects will be analyzed separately from Hispanic subjects. And that's so that race or ethnicity is not a confounding variable when you, when you examine these, these groups. Sometimes, but not often, you average that treatment influence across the different groups you conducted the analyses on. There's some drawbacks to these traditional methods. Multiple regression has the assumption that we are measuring every covariate that's important and it's included in the equation. That's not a realistic assumption for social sciences. It works great in um, a lot of the physical sciences, but not so much for social sciences because we have so many covariates that are correlated with the outcomes we care about. Matching is great, but it only balances people on matched covariates. And the more covariates you have, the harder it is to match people. It may not be hard to find a Hispanic female in this group and match her with a Hispanic female in this group. But if you have four or five or six covariates, finding two people with the exact co same combination of scores in both covariates can be very difficult. And you find yourself scrambling around to find a Hispanic female from a middle income family whose native language is English and who who has high motivation to take the course and to find her match, who's the same on all those variables in the other group, that becomes very difficult. I've never seen matching actually successfully carried out in a study I've read with more than four, four covariates. Then stratification has the problem of often requiring large sample size, because if you're going to analyze each group's data separately, you have to have a large enough sample size to conduct your stats for each group. Now with the t-test or with multiple regression, this might not be problematic, but what if you want to do confirmatory factor analysis? Or if you want a really complex hierarchical structural equation model, these are large end procedures. 
and you have to have a large n for each group. So instead of finding one sample with enough people, you're trying to find three separate samples or two separate samples with enough people, and that can be very difficult to do. So propensity score matching, what we do instead is we use many covariates, and we use those to predict the probability that a subject will be selected for either the treatment or the control group. It doesn't matter which group we predict. And the simplest way to do this is logistic regression. So this is the probability that they will be in treatment group W. One, um, W equals one, so treatment group zero if it's not. But they'll end up in one of the groups given their values on a bunch of covariates X. And so we're looking just for an expected probability that they'll be in the treatment group. And we can do that with just the logistic regression equation. And we can measure all, all their covariates and figure out their probability of getting the treatment. That's basically what I said in that first bullet point. So what we do is we use that logistic regression equation and we use that to predict that probability and save that as a new variable. Because that probability that they end up in the treatment group, that is their propensity score. Because it's a probability, the range is 0 to 1. With 0 meaning that they have no chance of being in the treatment group, 1 being mean that they can only be in the treatment group. And the beauty of these propensity scores is that it takes all of these covariates. Some of them are nominal, some of them are interval level, and it collapses all of these scores on all these covariates into a single score, a single probability that that person will end up in the treatment group. Yes. So to use your couch potato and gym rack example, <laughs> so is this essentially saying whether or not the person self-selects into which experimental condition is a byproduct of whatever factors we deem important? And so we're saying the gym rat's got a certain propensity for being in the treatment group, which is some GNC so muscle protein at 0.98 yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So is that what you're describing here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's just the probability that that in that case. The, the gym rats say, yeah, I'll take a free gym membership and, and do it. So do you use this when you are, when the, when the participants are self-selecting into experimental conditions and or when the experimenters are doing some kind of controlling as far as who goes into which condition? Well, you don't need to do it for random assignment. But any time you have some sort of selection bias, you can do this. It doesn't matter why the selection bias occurs. You can calculate a propensity score. Obviously, the more control you have, the closer it will be to something like 50-50. But in a free country where people have all sorts of options, you can get some wildly divergent propensity scores, and we'll see that here. Okay. So, so if you have very high or very low propensity scores, <clears throat> does this mean you're really going to have to oversample quite a bit to be able to get your... It's your counterfactual yeah. information? Yeah. Sometimes. And we'll, I'll show you when you sometimes have to throw out data because you don't. Because if someone has a 100% chance of being in the treatment group, we don't have any counterfactual information about what would happen to the control and vice versa. So you, you can already see where this is going. If I collapse all of these covariate values into a single score, instead of trying to match people on their scores on six or eight or ten covariates, or try to randomly assign them, and it would be a pointless field exercise, I can just match them on their propensity scores. And if, if you have a 30% chance of ending up in the treatment group, and you have a 30% chance of ending up in the treatment group, it doesn't matter that your combination of scores that gives you that 30% chance is different from his. Doesn't matter that you're different genders, doesn't matter that you're different SES groups, as long as I measure those covariates, if they get to the same probability that you'll be in the treatment group, I can compare those two subjects. Could you use the formula now to explain the dynamics of this propensity score? Yeah, it's just the, this is just the um, logistic regression, binary logistic regression formula. And so we're just trying to find the probability that the person will end up in the treatment group, given their, this is a vector, this capital X is a vector of covariate scores 
um, each of them measured a bunch of covariates. So instead of having x sub 1, comma x sub 2, dot, 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 x sub... Move over to this side. Okay. So over here, this is just the predicted probability in a logistic regression equation. So I find this one actually easiest. This is just 1 over 1 plus the constant e raised to negative x. In this case, x is a large number of covariates. It can be as small as 1, but it I don't know why you would want to do a method this complex with just one covariance. Um, if you're satisfied with just one covariance, just match them, if we're crying out loud. Um, but there's, there's scores on x times the beta weight. And this beta weight defines the relationship between all of these x covariates and their, probability, and, and their, their treatment group variable. So the outcome variable in this equation is actually the treatment variable. Did you get the control group or the treatment group? And it's just a traditional binary logistic regression equation. Um, so the outcome variable is that cognitive in this case. Thank you. Does that help? I'll try to look like I understood that. Let's move ahead. We also have the same assumption that we are including all the covariates that are important in this case. So yep. Yep, and I'll talk about the assumptions of this in a minute. But you're, you're completely right. So you're you're like 20 slides ahead. So am I good to go? Or, or um, it'll be a quiz later. Okay. But, you know. uh, so it's great because we take all of these variables, and we'll, I'll show you examples where there's dozens of covariates, and we collapse them into a propensity score, and that's all we match people on. Um, there's different ways to match people. The easiest and by far most common is to just stratify them, and that's what I'll show you later on. Um, there's also greedy matching methods, which maximize the use of your data. So, you know, as you said, for people at the extremes, we often don't have counterfactual information. This greedy matching methods, their main goal is to maximize efficiency, so you throw out as little data as possible. On the other hand, there's optimal matching methods, which maximize the similarity that people with similar propensity scores have. Because we can match them just on the propensity scores, but if we can match them on the propensity scores and make them similar on the covariates, well, that's just gravy. They're even more similar than before. Um, so optimal matching maximizes the similarity of people between your analysis groups, excuse me. And then there's fine balance methods, which um, are a new method based on nominal variables. So the next step really is to match people. Um, and again, it can be different combinations of scores. Um, so I've basically said this, but that's what a huge advantage over um, traditional methods of propensity score methods have is that you don't have to have the same combination of, of covariates. So that's part one. So now we're going to move on to part two, which looks, which is mostly on this this paper. This paper is mostly part one is at the top. Part two starts right here. If you follow the arrows, you'll understand where I'm going with this. So let me show you what this looks like with real data. This is a study I've, I've submitted. I've actually resubmitted it. It's already gone through one round of review. I should hear back any day now from the journal about the AP program in Utah. The state of Utah um, gave me data on every single public school child in the state for five years. Um, this is the only study I've done with that data, because when you get a data set of 850,000 people, you, you capitalize on that. But this one, I analyzed the graduating class of 2010 and the graduating class of 2011. So those were the two graduating cohorts that I have all four years of their high school data for. You can see the ends there. And I analyzed four AP tests, cal the two calculus tests and the two English language arts tests. In this example, I'll show you just the class of 2010 data and the language arts data, mostly because class of 2011, I did them just to replicate the study inside the same article. Uh, and the calculus one, it's not as interesting. There's fewer students who qualify for calculus. I don't think it's as generalizable. So I'm going to show you a really generalizable example. Um, and I have two groups of students. I have non-AP students. These are students who never took an AP course at all. They have no participation whatsoever in the AP program, at least for language arts. And then I also have what I call exam non-participants. These are students who enrolled in an AP English course during their, school, during their high school career. 
and did not take the test. So they sat through all the assignment. When test time came around in May, they opted not to take it. So theoretically, these are people that took the class but maybe didn't do as well. It's no, like, that, that's not the case, actually. I don't. No. So well, and also, you have universities like BYU that don't accept AP so credit. If you know you're going to go to BYU, why pay 85 bucks to take a test that's not going to benefit some you? Some see what writing on the wall. If, they, they take some. But yeah, some students limited. see the writing on the wall. They know they're probably not going to pass. Some students' okay. families can't afford it. Others know the college. They don't need it for college. Um, some might have never intended on taking it in the first place. They just want the letters AP on their high school transcript when they apply to college. They have no intention of taking it. So I guess going back to my question then, um, I was thinking that where you were going with this was comparing students who uh, weren't really good enough to pass the test and students who didn't think they were good enough to pass the test, so they didn't even bother taking the class at all. And now you were going to compare how they, whether the benefit of the class itself had any benefit. That's where I thought you were going with it, but obviously that's not the case. So why those two groups? Well, that's my question. That's a great question. One reason is because depending on the data set and the state and a wide variety of things, there's research showing that the majority of people in AP classes don't even take the test. In fact, you'll see when I show you the, the sample sizes later on for the different groups that that's true in Utah, at least for English tests. Mm -hmm. um, the other reason I was interested in this is because there's been this huge push from some state legislatures. Um, there's been a push from the US Department of Ed now for almost 10 years under administrations of both parties. Um, that the idea that AP for all, you know, what's good for the goose is what's good for the game. Everyone should be an AP. In fact, there's some high schools in other states where all the senior year English classes are either AP literature or language. Um, and so I'm, I'm interested in how, how smart is this AP for all idea? Does it really help students to sit in the classroom if they have no intention of taking the test? So that you don't have, you don't have a comparison group of AP students who took the test? I do, but I'm starting with the two group example. Yeah. You, you see exactly where this is going. Um, so my outcome variables are ACT scores. Not the best outcome variable. When you're doing secondary data analysis, you don't always get to pick and choose what variables you have. But it is a good measure of academic achievement that's independent of, of um, grade inflation. It's independent of high school effects. And um, most students in Utah do take the ACT. The majority do. And now that the state legislature is going to pay for that, almost everyone's going to. So I figured it was, a, it was a good outcome. So here's what you get if you do a traditional t-test. I have the ACT composite score, and then the math, English, reading, and science subscores. And you can see that we all have huge point differences. Um, and the Cohen's Ds, they range from this statistically non-significant 0.032 to 0.136 being the maximum. And these four with the asterisks are statistically significant. So just by looking at these results, there's a little bit of a boost, but it's not impressive. You can think of other ways that might be better to boost kids' um, ACT scores a half point. But that would be the, the treatment effect you would estimate without controlling for any covariates. Can I ask a question? When, yeah, you, when you said those were significant coincidences, the underlying t-tests were significant, and then you converted to coincidences. Yeah. Thank you. Well, or I, these differ significantly from zero which would mean the same thing. So, either or, which are, if you think better in underlying t-tests, great. If you think better in effect sizes like I do, that's okay. So, I use multiple imputation to handle missing data, because I had huge amounts of missing data. I had very few people who had um, data on all of their variables. Um, so that's how I handle missing data. Because of that, you'll see some slight variations in the tables and the sample size. It'll be off by one or two here and there. That's just the statistical artifact of the, of the, of the multiple imputation. But I have 50 covariates. I'm going to control for 50 variables here. Everything from their high school GPA every year, their basic state achievement test scores that they took in high school, uh, how many days they take every year, race, ethnicity, gender, low income status. All these combined, I have 50 covariates. Far more than I can ever match with, practically, in the real world. 
So I use logistic regression. Here's what the SPSS window looks like. Um, but most of you have seen this. Here's the list of all the variables in the data set on the left. Here's the covariates that I'm putting as independent variables in my logistic regression. And my outcome is the group membership variable, whether they are a non-AP student or an exam non-participant. That's my outcome variable for the, the dependent variable um, on the final multiple regression. Did you say your sample, your pool, your sample sizes for each of those two groups? Because one should be lots, lots bigger than Oh, yeah. One of them is significantly bigger. Um, the total N is over 41,000, just a hair over 41,000. The exact number of participants are 16,000, and then the other is 24,000. So you're completely right. Then about two to three. Yeah. Yep. In fact, it's almost exactly a 60-40 split. So. And so then you do that logistic regression. The options on SPSS, you save the predicted probability that they'll be in either group. It doesn't matter. I call my treatment group the AP group because I figure that's the treatment. So you save the probability there'll be an AP um, exam non-participant as a new variable, and that's the propensity score. It, Here's a screenshot of my data window, and I called it prop score. It's a little hard to see. I should have I should have made it bigger, but I ordered this sample of <coughs> ascending order of propensity scores, and most people on the screen have about a 75% chance of being in that AP non-participant group. And here's the means and standard deviations on the propensity score. So the average non-AP student had a 36.7% chance of being an AP non-participant. Well, since that's the average and it's below 50%, we shouldn't be surprised that so many of them are non-AP students. <clears throat> sort of makes sense. For the exam non-participants, they had a, a predicted probability of 46.9% on average. And there's the standard deviations. After you have your, your propensity scores, the next step is to find what's called the region of common support. Now, we can only use propensity score analysis if the propensity scores for each group overlap. Because if someone has, for example, a propensity score of zero, again, there's no counterfactual information in the other group for them. Uh, it's not just zeros, but any extreme value. It's very difficult to find people in the other group who provide counterfactual information. So the region of common support is just the area where these two box plots overlap. Um, and you throw out anybody whose scores are lower than the minimum for the other group or higher than the maximum for the other group. Because I have so many covariates, my sample size is so large, I only had to throw out two people. They're at the very bottom of this non-AP group. Um, but that shouldn't surprise you. If, when you think about it, if someone has a 1% chance of being in the AP group, and my sample size is large enough that three or four or 500 people um, have that 1% chance, well, then a couple of them are going to end up in the AP group for whatever reason. So all it takes is for one person to be really low or really high to make your region of common support very large. And that's, that's sort of nice. Regions of common support um, tend to be very large if the overlap of propensity scores is very large between the two groups. I mean, their means aren't very different here. Their interquartile ranges overlap. So that, that's why I had to throw out so many people. But if you have covariates that are very good at separating your two groups, are very good at distinguishing between who will be in the treatment group, who won't be. Your region of common support tends to be smaller, and you have to throw out more people. You also tend to have to throw out a larger proportion of your sample if you have smaller sample sizes. So, but here, with over 40,000 people, I really didn't have to worry about that. After you've thrown out everyone who's outside the region of common support, you stratify your sample. You divide it up into groups based on their propensity scores. So I have 10 equally sized groups here. I have 10 deciles. And this bottom group has a propensity score of 8.6% to 25.3%. 
those are people at the lowest probability, the lowest 10% of probabilities of being an exam non-participant. So even though all of them had low probabilities, my sample size is so large, I still have 992 AP participants from that group. And unsurprisingly, as the propensity score goes up, the number of non-AP students goes down, and the number of AP students goes up, and the percentages do too. And you can see here the split is almost exactly 3 to 1.92%, 40.8% overall. So you stratify your sample, and then you check the balance of the covariates. You have to verify that these propensity scores and stratification balanced out the covariates on all of the variables you, um, you use in your logistic regression equation. Um, normally you would just look at p-values um, and see whether they're still balanced, but my sample size is so large I'm going to reject almost any null hypothesis. So, but you create equations where the dependent variable is now the covariate, and the independent variables are the stratum that the person belongs to, and the treatment group, and the interaction between the two. So probably the hardest thing to do when you're doing all this after you've sat through a couple workshops is just keeping in mind blended variables of independent and dependent variables in the different equations. Yeah? I think I lost you on this step. Okay. So, I mean, what, can you go back to what, I understand, I understand how you stratified. Mm -hmm. And I thought you were going to say that you had to, um, like in that first stratum, you, you have 992 non-exam participants uh, that meet that criteria and 3,000, and so that you would actually only be able to take the, the minimum from each of those groups. Is that? Um, like the minimum propensity score from each group? Not the minimum propensity score, but you wouldn't be able to use all 3,121. I mean, you're, you're, you're trying to create a sample, yeah. right, for each of these groups. So you'd, you'd have 992, you could use all of them and then that are in that, and then you'd have to select 992 yeah. from that group. Um, it depends on how you, you match your participants. With stratification, you use everyone within the stratum, as long as in the region of common support. If you did an optimal matching, you would only use 992 from each group. Okay. Um, but what we're going to do at the end is basically do a form of a t-test, and you don't have to have equal size groups for a traditional t-test. You don't need them here either. Okay. Um, but you're right. There are matching strategies that do require that. And um, I like stratification because it works far more often than not, and you don't have to throw out data if you if Everyone's inside the region of common support. I have the data to throw out here, but why? I don't have to. So, we do have to verify, though, that the stratification and the propensity score successfully control for the covariates. And do that, you create a, um, a model where the covariates, the dependent variable now, and stratum and their treatment group is the independent variable along with the interaction. Um, so you had, 50, you had 50 covariates, you ran this 50 times? Yep. That was a, you imagine that was a fun day at work. Because um, <laughs> I mean, it is the same thing. Um, and that's why I just, I just throw the equations in my SPSS syntax, I run it, I come back about 15 minutes later, and in this case I check all my effect sizes. Um, and I, I just arbitrarily decided if the eta squared is 1% or higher, then that would be cause for concern, and I would need to examine those variables more closely. 45 of the 50 um, effect sizes for the main effects were less than 1%. Five of them were greater than 1%. The largest one was an effect size of 4% for the um, eta squared. Uh, but none of the interactions were statistically, but, well, not statistically, but practically statistically. So here's an example for an odd, for a nominal out, um, covariate. Uh, I don't look at the p-values because the odds ratio, an odds ratio of 0.7 or 1.43, and both these are equivalent to an eta squared of 1%. That's always going to be statistically significant if your n is at least 948. Well, my n is over 40,000, so 
I'm not even bothering p values. But you can see that these are inside that range of 0.7 to 1.43, so I wasn't very concerned about that covariate. I have a question that probably is you don't want to go into. I don't understand why you have to do interaction term two. Maybe we'll talk about it afterwards. Yeah. Don't go into it. Okay. That's fine. Uh, here's an example with uh, ANOVA. This is a, an interval level covariate. In fact, this was their Algebra 2 scores. Again, when A to score is 1%, your, your effect size is going to be statistically significant uh, with 948 people. So I just ignored my p values. And you can see here's my math for my effect sizes. And when, when your effect size is that small, you don't need to bother. I, clearly, the logistic regression was very successful in balancing this covariate. If your covariates are still too unbalanced, you have several options for what you should do. One is to add more strata. In fact, that's what I did here. I have 10 strata because the original five I had were, were not working. Um, and when you add more strata, you reduce variability within strata, and you maximize it between. So that's going to reduce the, um, the impact of the um, group membership and its effect size. So I was very successful with 10 strata, but most people do four, five, six. You can also transform your covariates. If you have a really problematic covariate, you can square it or square root or take a logarithmic transformation. You have to do some sort of nonlinear transformation and then recalculate new propensity scores with this transform covariate. Restratify and check the common support again. If you do one of these things, you have to back up a couple steps. If it's justified theoretically, you can remove some strata from analysis. I didn't have to do that, but I could make the argument that the bottom 10% of students probably aren't going to succeed in, in an AP course. No one's seriously thinking we should give AP to them, so we, we can remove them from that. It's just like throwing data out from your region uh, that's outside region of common support. You just recognize you're throwing away data. Yeah. So. I'm not following the argument here very well because it seems like all you have to do to add more strata is change your change your ranges because it, it was it, it they were arbitrary in the first place. Yeah. So any number of strata work. Um, if you have too many strata, though, I haven't counted this. I've done this before. Um, sometimes interaction effects start showing up and causing problems. But yeah, there's nothing, there's no rule of how many strata you need. Um, as long as your sample sizes within each strata are large enough that, you know, you could detect an, uh, an unbalanced covariate that were there, that's okay. Um, your number of strata is arbitrary. And so adding more strata tends to reduce variability within strata and maximize it between, which will minimize this, oops, I wasn't slide ahead, I was wrong, which will minimize this effect size here and this one too. Because you don't care if there's, if your stratum effect size is large. In fact, that's what you're interested in. You're trying to reduce variability within strata and between treatment groups. Is that, does that help at all? Yeah, so bas basically, Basically, you strategize with your stratum mm -hmm. to have. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> you basically need a certain n within your strat. So, if, so if you, so if you have a highly variable um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not even drawing the right words, but you have a pretty you have, a, you have spread across your strata pretty evenly the 40,000, but if you were to have a set of strata where in some cases you only had five or six, and in other cases you had you know, 50, 100, you might be in trouble. Yep. And you often get that when you don't have a large number of covariates. Here, I had very few ties. If you look at this screenshot of my propensity scores, I should, I should have made it bigger. I, just, I didn't think I would need to dwell on what a data window looks like in SPSS. But 
if you look up really close, even at the fifth digit, there aren't many ties here. This person's 0.74935, this one's 0 0.74937, 0 0.74941. Right. Um, I don't have a large number of ties. You get that sort of situation when you do have a large number of ties, which tends to arise when you have a small number of covariates. Because when you have a small number of covariates, you have fewer combinations of covariates, and you're, you have fewer predictive probabilities. So. So, so eliminating strata, you can eliminate strata by collapsing strata so that you have a, a proper number within each strata. Can you just remove a, a, like remove strata number eight because it doesn't have yeah. and do you, do you have to justify that on any grounds other than it doesn't have the numbers. Well, I mean, you're removing it because you don't have proper counterfactual information All right. for people in the strata. In the strata. Um, and yeah, people have, people have difficulty throwing out data, and I do too. Uh, on the other hand, you already threw out anyone who's outside of your region of common support, and all it does is it reduces your generalizability. There's always that tension between internal and external validity. <clears throat> the greater the internal validity you have, the less generalizable your study tends to be, and vice versa. The same thing's happening here. But the, the difference is that the strata 8, you know, let's say you pulled out strata 8, that means absolutely nothing comprehensible because it's some kind of mixed combination of 50 covariates. So there's not really any way to meaningfully determine Yeah, you're right. Uh, unbalanced strata, uh, unbalanced covariates tend to be found in strata that are either your highest or your lowest. So actually, you rarely get a situation where strata 8 of 10 is your problematic one, but 1 through 7 and 9 and 10 are good. Um, usually you end up saying, well, I'm going to throw out my bottom 10%. Or, oh, I'm going to throw out the top 10% because they're weird. They, they enjoy studying and, and they want to take 8 AP classes their senior year. <coughs> usually it's people who are outliers you tend to be throwing out. Um, if you do have situations where strata three and strata seven are, are the are the odd ones, there's probably an interaction going on here, and you probably have other serious problems. And we ran the original um, logistic regression the fifty covariates. Could you could you have seen an early flag that some of your covariates were going to be funky even there by looking at their their loadings onto the logistic? Yeah, if, if you have convergence problems or if you have multicollinearity problems, I was actually really surprised I had multicollinearity problems yeah, here. With 50 variables? Yeah, with 50 variables and, and a lot of them being highly, highly really. I think my, my um, worst um, uh, multicollinearity pro problem, I can't remember, remember which one, if it's BIF or the other one, where one's the reciprocal of the other. But I think the largest number on a scale from one to I was really surprised. Um, and so, yeah, you can spot convergence problems, you can spot multicollinearity problems, you can you can spot really bizarre factor loadings, really wonky standard errors, and that's usually a hint that your your logistic model doesn't fit your data well. Right, and then when, it, then when you start doing this second run, those same variables yep. that were wonky here are going to pop up here. Yep. Um, Although not always. Sometimes you just get surprised by a wonky variable. And, you know, data sometimes surprises us. That's, that's why we play with it. Another, another option you can do if you have unbalanced covariates is just to use a different matching method. You might use an optimal matching method that maximizes the similarity of people and matches across group, or you might use greedy matching so you're throwing out less data. You, you have other options. Usually stratification works pretty well, though. So here's my strata. Um, they're all almost exactly the same sample size, although this doesn't always happen, especially if you choose to stratify uh, um, before you check for your region of common support. There's disagreement about whether you throw people out from outside the region of common support first and then stratify or vice versa. I like having even-sized strata, but that's just me. 
and you put your means for your outcome variable, in this case this is ACT composite scores, for your treatment group and your control group, and then within each stratum you find that difference. And you use this equation to calculate the weighted average uh, for that. In this case, since all the stratum are the same size, it's, well, almost the same size, but to the second decimal place, it's going to be um, just an arithmetic mean. We find that the differences range from negative 0.01 to positive 0.37. The average is 0.212. Then you take that 0.212 and you calculate an effect size with it. Cohen's D is the easiest one in the two group situation. You put that 0.212 right here. You divide it by the standard deviation of the, um, of the sample. Um, most people choose to make the standard deviation of the sample that does not have, excuse me, that is inside the region of common support. But just two people out of 41,000 being thrown out, it's not going to make a big difference here. Um, which standard deviation you use, and here's our results. Now our effect sizes range from 0.02 to 0.07, and four out of five of them are smaller than what they were with the traditional t-test results. This is the only one that's larger, but you'll remember math was the one that was statistically non-significantly different from zero. And so the fact that it went up a little bit tells me it's just further proof that that was probably a, a effect size of zero for all intents and purposes. Um, but the other four, <coughs> controlling for these covariates reduced our, our estimate impact of the treatment by 41 to 77%. And if we hadn't controlled for these 50 covariates, we would be grossly overestimating the impact of sitting in an AP class, that impact of that treatment on um, on students' ACT scores. So there you go, there's the two group situation. Any questions? Have the AP teacher started um, hunting you down yet? Not yet. <laughs> after I get it published, after I sell it, well, you're not as effective as you think you are. <laughs> I'll, I'll make enemies soon enough in my career, don't you worry. Um, what, what considerations to overthink do you have with this? I mean, obviously, I mean, we were all surprised you having more hyperlinearity issues with mm -hmm. 50 covariates, but it just seems like with that large of a model from a logistic regression standpoint, you just run into lots of overfit problems potentially. I mean, how concerned are you that with that kind of method? Um, obviously, the more covariates you have, the more of a concern that is. Um, but because I have data from every single high school student, everything from kids in life skills class, for whom AP is not on anyone's radar, to kids who take nothing but AP classes, I have a lot more variation in the covariates and in the outcome and in even unmeasured covariates. And so I think that that's what protects me. This example from overfit. Have you, have you ever done this where you do this maybe with 50 covariates, but then you go back and say, you know, theoretically based off of literature, we would expect that there's a top five covariates and compare what you find with just five covariates versus, say, with 50? Um, that's a possibility. That's a good idea. Um, I haven't done that myself. But the beauty with propensity score matching is sometimes you do throw in a variable that doesn't matter. Well, if you do, it doesn't impact your, your, your model very much, especially with a large sample size. Um, as long as you're not running into multicollinearity problems, then um, you know, having garbage independent variable in there controlling for juggling ability is great. Just one more parameter and I have the degrees of freedom. So <laughs> um, That's what I like about it is because, is because it, it does have an exploratory flavor to it. On the other hand, when the state told me that they had thousands of variables that I had to choose from, I did pick the ones that I thought theoretically would be very important. And, you know, you do reach a point where, okay, we don't need to add this into the I don't seriously think their gym grades are going to have a huge impact on this. So. Any other questions before we move on to the three or more group examples? Yes. Yeah, I just have a small question. Um, yeah, with, with the effect sizes uh, on the <coughs> first analysis with the t test, right? <coughs> the, even though way it back. dropped, yeah, way back. Even though it dropped, those are still small effect sizes. They are. Way. So, 
and, and even though they're statistically significant, they're not. <coughs> they're, if, it, if that was an experiment, yeah. I wouldn't. It, yeah, I mean, I you, you, don't, you don't look at these results and say, holy cow, an eighth of a standard deviation, AP for all. No, but <laughs> this is data that I had that was an example for this workshop. The reason I used this data in real research was for the three or one group example. But has the similar approach been used, though, for something that, that gets a really strong effect size? For instance, uh, if you had a pre-post measure and did some powerful treatment. Yep. Yeah, I've seen it. Um, you sometimes see it in medical studies. Um, and, and so you see this drop that kind of similar yeah. as this. Oh yeah, you see a 40, 50, 60 percent drop. And when we, I show you the three group example, we'll see some drops that are that are even larger than some of these. Okay. So to these score matching is why do you use this? Yeah. Is it fair to say that the the value of this really is the uh, maximizing the comparability of the groups. That's exactly the value, because we want counterfactual information that we don't have otherwise without doing a true experiment. Right. And the more comparable we make the groups, the more counterfactual information we have, the more accurate our estimates of the treatment are. So that's what I was just saying with this, is that this one, you're not, you haven't maximized the comparability of the two groups, but using the propensity scores, you maximize the comparability of the two groups, which then well, you could go either way for the... You're trying to remove the selection bias. Yes. That's what I meant by it. So, um, but you talked about the effect size almost always going down. In education, usually. But sometimes effect sizes can go up, especially um, for interventions where it's not some sort of self-selection <coughs> going on, but it's uh, an intervention to try to improve people who are doing poorly to get better. Um, that can often cause the effect sizes to go up because the treatment group are the people who are starting lowest and, and are struggling the most. It depends on your dependent variable, it depends on your covariates, but most education studies I've read, the effect sizes go down. And so, I've seen some where they go so would it be accurate to say then that using this more uh, this better tool for for sampling and and calculating the effect sizes that basically we're showing we're, we're showing on the whole that. The other method stinks, but we're not really showing uh, good, I mean, we're not really able to show that our outcomes or our interventions are, are making a, a strong difference. <laughs> Well, it depends on what you, what you come up with. Yeah, in this example, no. Uh, I mean, you're completely right. This this outcome is not very impressive at all. It wasn't impressive to start with, but it got even less impressive than that was possible. Um, and so what you're doing is you're just controlling for that selection bias. And sometimes it shows that our treatments are way more effective than we thought they were. Sometimes it shows that it the effect size drops to zero. Um, it depends. It's not that the method stinks. T-tests work very well. They're very robust to assumptions. But if you don't have random assignment, then you're not comparing apples to apples and you're missing counterfactual information. It's a design problem, not a statistical yeah. problem. Yeah, it's not the problem, it's not the T-test fault that your groups aren't comparable, it's your design. Well, another thing is that, you know, when you're talking about it going down, the effect size going down, all interventions will have some effect if it's reasonable that you expect that you go to an advanced class, you're paying attention, you're learning something, it will have some effect. But then if you compare, you lessen the uh, um, selection bias that you had, then you're going to reduce that effect because you're not having all the people in there that um, shouldn't have been in the group anyhow. Yeah. But, or we're over -sampling. I want to move on to the, the three or more groups. This is the extension. Now, propensity score matching has been around in medicine and, um, and in psychology for a little over 20 years now. But the 
it was limited to two groups until recently. And so this is how you do it in three or more groups. And this is with this page of the handout now. It has more seven point stars because it's more complex, but not too much once you grasp the two group version. So again, same group of students, class of 2010, same AP steps, but now I'm expanding to four groups. I still have my non-AP students, they're the same ones as before. I still have my non-exam participants. Now I've added exam non-passers. These are students who take the AP class, take the test, and they only earn a score of one or two on the five-point scale. And then my highest group is my exam passers. They take the class, take the test, and they pass it with a score of three or higher. So these are ordinal groups, ranging from no treatment to maximum level of treatment. I like to think of it in terms of a medical study. This is the dosage of the AP program they're getting. Uh, and that's how originally this method was conceptualized, was to uh, accommodate dosage studies in, uh, in medicine. Same outcome variables. Russ, I need you to clarify one question. Yeah, yeah. In the dependent variable, is this the multiple ACT scores? Is this just the English one? Uh, well, it's, it's still the AP English test, but just like the last one, it's the ACT composite plus the four subscales. Which AP test is it? Um, if they take either the AP English Literature or sorry, Language. I'm sorry, which ACT test is it? Um, the, the, so the most students, overall. many students take it three times, four times, nine um, times. Their, their highest score. Their highest score. Yeah. Yeah, I thought you meant like which version. It's like, well, they oh. constantly are replenishing <laughs> items. If you really want to turn this into a psychometric the one that counts. counts. <laughs> the one they take to get to college. Yeah, it's it's their highest one because that's what, that's what the state collects. So if you do an ANOVA, here's your here's your results. Your effect sizes range from 6.21 percent to 13 percent. You've seen these two rows of means. But now we have the 1,160 exam non-passers and the 3,165 exam passers. And first time I saw this, it blew my mind. Roughly three quarters, a little over three quarters of students in these classes aren't even bothered to take the test here in Utah. I mean, I, I was really surprised it was that high. I knew it would be over half. You know, I was surprised it was over half. That, that doesn't surprise me at all because a lot of students come to BYU. If you were to take the two language tests, you can't get 16 credits at BYU, you get, they don't even want you to be able to pass out a freshman English now, but, you know, so there's, there, there's incentives for students want to be in the AP classes because they're the best yeah. teachers in the school, the, the most challenging classes, but they don't necessarily need the credits. Yeah. The research I'd seen earlier was that the estimate was, well, it depends on the test, and sample, but 30 to 60 percent of people don't take the test. So when this came out, it was about 75 percent. That was cool. Um, so same thing, multiple regression again. This time I have 66 covariates. It's actually because this is what I did for my study and for this workshop. I simplified, I simplified with just two groups. And actually, some of these covariates were balanced with just two groups. And I think it's because adding these high academic achievement achievers um, added some variation to the sample. It wasn't there before. So 66 covariates now. Migrant mobile status, special ed status, English language learning status each year. Those are the ones that weren't there before. So if you do a regular multinomial logistic regression um, equation to, to calculate propensity scores, you're going to run into a problem. Because the number of probabilities you get, excuse me, the, the number of um, parameter estimates you get is going to be equal to k minus 1, where k is your number of groups. Uh, if you want to find the propensity score for the final group, you just do a 1 minus the propensity scores for the others. Uh, the problem is three or more groups, having three or more groups, can, uh, creates more than one propensity score. And the whole point for propensity score is to take all of these covariate scores and collapse into one number. Well, if you have more than two groups, 
You're not collapsing them to one number. This is the problem. So the solution is to use marginal mean weighting through stratification. This is a non-parametric solution to the problem of having multiple propensity scores. And all it does is it applies weights to the sample to simulate a true experiment. And these are sort of like sampling weights that you often see in survey or longitudinal research. If you've ever worked with one of the data, with one of the Department of Ed's data sets, they have panel weights and they have other weights that you apply to your data to ensure that you have the correct um, um, proportionality, correct representation of your of the data for the population. So this is just like weighting a survey sample to compensate for non-response among certain groups. And the reason this works is because of the proportional odds model, which is a categorical data analysis model that models the, um, the effect size between any two adjacent ordinal groups as being able to be summed up by a single parameter beta, parameter estimate beta. And so basically what the proportional odds model does is it um, finds a, a, a beta parameter that models um, your difference between your bottom group and your second group, and your second group and your third group, and it's the same um, beta that fits for, for both. And so because of that, I'll show you what why this works, if you have a cumulative probability um, graph where x is your covariate values and y is your probability that a person will be in a given group or below, um, the proportional odds model ensures that these s curves are parallel. And because they're parallel, the only way they differ is by a constant, by, a, by an intercept term. It doesn't matter which probability we use to sort people on. Most people pick either the highest group or the lowest group out of convenience. Um, makes the arithmetic a little bit easier. Um, but because of that, we can collapse all these propensity scores into just one because either the highest one or the lowest one will order people on, it will, will arrange people in the same order. So the fact that we have multiple Scores doesn't matter. So I use that multinomial ordinal logistic regression, excuse me, not multinomial, but ordinal logistic regression, a proportional odds model, to create propensity scores, do it the same way as before, except I use a different model. I save it again, it's still a propensity score. And I decided to use the probability that the person will be in the highest group, the exam passers group. So you can see the the mean probabilities for each group, the standard deviations, and the ends. And unsurprisingly, as we go up as far as the level of the group, the mean propensity score also goes up. That shouldn't be very surprising. This one, you can tell just by eyeballing it, very highly skewed. So just like the two group propensity score method, we still have to find a region of common support. Um, but this time, because there's more groups, you tend to throw out more data because anybody whose propensity score is lower than the propensity score for any of the other three groups, or it's higher than the maximum propensity score for any of the other three groups, you throw them out. So in this case, I threw out over 1,600 people. It's a lot, yes, way more than two, by the way. Um, but still, it's less than 4% of my sample, because my sample is so large. And I did what a lot of people who are throwing out large numbers of subjects from their studies like this do. I compared my subjects who I threw out with the ones who remain, and they tended to be the students in the the very absolute lowest levels of academic achievement. Um, so I said, okay, I'm going to remember that the bottom 3%, 4% of this, of the public um, high school population in Utah, this study probably won't apply to. I can live with that, see how the AP program tends to cater to more advanced students. 
So again, just like a two group method, you divide your, your sample into strata. Again, usually five or six are enough, but I still need a 10. And then um, you, again, you check that your covariates are balanced on um, your strata. Again, same situation, same thing where covariates are dependent variables, stratum and outcome of their interaction are independent variables. I use the same, um, the same uh, criteria to determine whether my covariates were balanced or not. And this time, 63 of my 66 covariates were balanced, so um, just a hair over 95%. And the most imbalanced one was 12th grade migrant status. Its odds ratio is 0 0.6, which if you convert it into an eta squared is 1.9%. Yes. Again, was there no collinearity issues with this? Nope. Um, I thought there would be. I'm not going to lie. I mean, I was just as surprised as as you are. I do want to say that because um, if you look at the list, because migrant students also tend to be mobile and they also tend to be Hispanic and English language learners, I believe that the values were higher, but they're still, um, they still were high enough that I didn't have any concern. There was some multicollinearity, but none that I was concerned about. Uh, but you're right, when you have a large number of covariates, you, you worry about that. So besides that difference in the equation, another big difference is you have to calculate a weight for your sample. And the number of weights is the number of strata times the number of groups. In this case, that would be 40 weights. Um, and if you're like me and you hate this sort of text at the bottom, here's how I always explain variable equations to myself. I always have the arrow. This is the total number of people in that particular stratum. This is the average probability or the marginal probability um, that the group is in treatment. And then this is the actual number of people in that strata and in that stratum and the um, group. And these are all numbers that are very easy to come by. You can get these with um, frequency distributions and you can calculate that probability very easily. In this example, the median weight was 1.122. Usually median weights are close to one because one means that that treatment group is proportionally represented in, within that particular stratum. So weights above one means that that person belongs to a group that's underrepresented in that stratum. Weights below one indicate that the person belongs to a group that's overrepresented in that stratum. And in this study, 90% of the weights were below 6.5. Um, we usually don't worry with very low weights. It means we have too much information about people in that group within that stratum. We worry more about very high weights because it means we have a severe lack of uh, information about people in that group in that stratum. And you can see the weights here. So this is the number of people in the stratum and this is their weight. Here we have almost exact proportional representation. Here we have a whole lot of exam passers because they have the highest build probability of passing the AP test in the first place. So they're grossly overrepresented in this top stratum, which is why we weight their, their data with the weight of 0.18, which is um, the smallest out of all of them. I do get a little concerned, and I mentioned this in the limitations of my manuscript, with these ones in red. They range from 6.32 all the way up to 204.14. Against all odds, two people who are in this bottom 10% probability of passing the AP test, two of them in the state did pass. Um, you, know, you, you want to give the kid a pat on the back if they, if they make it to that. Did you take into account homeschooling? Uh, the state does not have uh, data on homeschoolers unless they choose to submit it, which obviously most parents don't. Could those two have been homeschooled? Um, I doubt it. I didn't hunt them down in, in my data set to figure out who they were. Um, I could. It wouldn't be hard. But when you have very large weight, the results, very large weights, the results tend to be unstable. And so comparing people at the very bottom of academic achievement with exam passers, I would do with a lot of caution, um, recognizing that we're giving these two people 
the same amount of influence as we would normally in a true experiment, 400 people. Look, let's be careful. Yeah. Well, I, I just be careful when you have weights that large. It, it makes me a little nervous. It's something to be aware of. There's no hard and firm rule about when you need to think of weights large. Now, some people say 10, some people say 5. I just figured that a cutoff of about 6 was reasonable. And then with the weighted data, you do a one-way ANOVA. And this time, the effect sizes range from 1.72 to 5.92. All of the effect sizes are smaller than the smallest effect size before we started this propensity score analysis. So again, controlling for these covariates drove down our effect sizes. How much? Well, from 52 to 72%. So if I had control for these covariates, I'd be overestimating by at least a factor of two the impact of the AP program on students' ACT scores. Really quick, so my time's almost done. Do you want to talk about limitations of the method in general? Just like multiple regression, propensity score analysis assumes that we have measured all relevant covariates <coughs> and that they're included in our propensity score model. If we're missing any covariates, then their positive or their negative impact will be attributed solely to the treatment. With the AP program, I can think of a lot of covariates that would maybe inflate the, my estimate of the treatment's effectiveness, things like varying levels of motivation, study time, parental support. Um, I have a hard time thinking of variables that might make AP look weaker than it really is in the situation. So I consider these effect sizes to be the maximum level of effectiveness uh, of the impact of the AP program. We also have to worry about SUPVA, the stable unit treatment value assumption. Just two parts. One is that an individual person's outcome is not influenced by how treatment is assigned. So if treatment is assigned in some way that breeds resentment, or maybe encourages a compensatory, competitive streak in people, that may make this method break down, and we don't really have counterfactual information. The other component is that one particular person's outcome is independent of the treatment assigned to other people in the sample. I can imagine this AP study, some people might be taking the class because their friends are in it, or because you know their friends aren't in it, or you know, that may be violated in this situation. And just like was said earlier, results aren't generalizable to people who fall outside of the region of health and support. As far as this particular study limitations, I think that um, AP effects that may be cumulative. I only examine eight, um, English AP classes and tests and their impact in, independent of any other AP. It's possible that if a student has a successful AP experience their sophomore year and they take more AP classes their junior year and more in their senior year that those effects may be cumulative. I don't model that here. Um, it's also possible that school and teacher variables need to be modeled. I don't have um, the impact of the, of the tendency for AP classes to be smaller for the teachers to be the best educated ones at a high school. I don't, I don't model that. Um, and a lot of student variables aren't modeled either. So there are some limitations in this. Yes? How about the, the fact that just by definition, certain students select themselves to take AP? They're more motivated. They tend to do more homework. Even just taking it, they're more likely to pass the test. Um, if you can measure motivation, then you can control for that self-selection as a covariate. In. But just by definition, students who sign up for AP are different from their, their colleagues in their classes. Mm -hmm. Just I mean, their, their other classes. Just because they said, I'm, I want to do this. and. So it, it just, it, in my mind, it, it, it creates a whole raft of other problems of how can I even look at this group because, by definition, it's a specialized portion of the population. But that's kind of what this whole design was, yeah. was doing, right? Mm -hmm. It was basically waiting 
you know. So you signed up for AP, that makes you 70% more motivated than me, so we add those kinds of, we're basically waiting for that to kind but, of control but to try to But try to use that data to talk about the value of the AP program is a problem, that's what I'm getting at. Well, but his point is, he, he had access to 66 variables that could help remove that selection bias. Mm -hmm. What you're saying is there's a selection bias problem. He's saying, we acknowledge that, that's why we're doing the study. Now he's saying that above and beyond those 66 covariates that I did have access to, there were others that I didn't. Yeah. Right. And until I measure every possible covariate, which secondary data really can't do, um, there still will be some selection bias left. And that's why I think that these effect sizes are probably the maximum estimates. Um, and you're right, it's, I still have a control for everything, but it's better than controlling for nothing. <laughs> and there's only ever been one other study using propensity scores to examine the AP program. They only control for eight covariates. And all of their all of their sample were students who were in introductory science courses at um, at East Coast universities. My sample is way more academically diverse and I control for way more covariates. It will never beat a true experiment, though. Sure. This will never exceed the quality of a classical experiment. Sure. But when it's the best you got, it's the best you got. I don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. I'm a really pragmatic guy. So. Wait, you're saying a classical experiment would be the perfect solution? I don't well, know if I buy that. <laughs> not completely, but would be the perfect solution for the selection bias problem. Selection bias. This is the next best thing. Yeah. In a free society, you can't do that. You will do AP, you won't. Oh, uh, you'd get, you'd get different out. That's a great question. Say so, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what was the question? <laughs> Unrealistic. I'm sure it depends yeah. on how many no way to do it. you control. Because part of what makes an AP class um, an AP class is that you have groups self-selecting into them. It's true experience control if you, on every class. If you did that's what they find it's interesting. Even ones you don't care about. Yeah. No, Theoretically. Well, I ran a study, but not with propensity scores, but just with multiple random selection on groups to see how often they were on various variables. But it would be interesting to use propensity scores using that same model to test the comparability of selection bias on control groups and randomized control style. It's a huge assumption that random assignment covers common cause. Covers a multitude of sins we've never seen. Well, I believe it may be the best, but it's won't be lacking. I'm not as convinced that it's perfect to... In, in the real world, it doesn't work as well as theory does. I always have a student when I teach about groups going to say, but Dr. Warren, what if you just got a really unlikely assignment where all the men end up in one group and all the women in another? 5% of the time. Yeah. At least. Yeah. In theory. Or more. Yeah.